Anybody in the chat? Can you give me a quick yes, no, if you can hear me okay? Yeah, I know, right? Live. Hi, Nathan. How are you? Okay, cool. So you guys can hear me. We're just going to do a quick mic check here of the other mic um, while we're standing outside. Better to fix these problems now than when we're in there and we can't hear anything. Yeah, so uh, most likely the audio will be unsynced. So I don't know why that problem was that we had it last time, but it does seem to be unsynced between my mouth and the audio. But it'll be less of a problem when we actually go in there because we'll be wearing masks. So you won't be able to see that it's actually unsynced from our audio. So what you're hearing right now is the first mic. And then let's take this one off. And now this is the second mic. So Nathan or, or anybody else in the chat, it, it should sound roughly the same, um, probably still desynced, but I can't fix that right now. So can you hear the second mic okay? Cool. Oh good, Duck's here too. Nice to see you, Duck. So I will take this one off so we don't break it. Okay, so what we're going to be uh, doing, what you can expect, is this is probably going to run for about another 45 minutes, maybe up to an hour. So we're going to spend about 15 minutes outside here, uh, and I'm going to walk you through some of the concepts that we're going to see with the equipment that's um, inside. And I've actually set this up uh, just right so that you can see the equipment. Let me move my finger. This one. Um, by the end of today, we're going to try to wind up finishing this stream up on top of that piece of equipment, which is pretty neat. I, I don't know if we'll actually be able to go to the one that's running, uh, but they said they were actually going to shut two of them down for us so that we could actually go up on top of that equipment. So I'm looking forward to that because that's pretty neat. Um, they usually don't let us do that at all, which is nice that they can actually do something like that. Um, for the first 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about some of the concepts of that particular piece of equipment, why we might need that kind of equipment, um, and where it shows up inside of our engineering curriculum, right? What kinds of classes that we see um, with that sort of stuff. Hang on just a second. Turning off uh, chat there for a moment. Not, sorry, not chat. I'm not muting you guys. I was muting my text messages. Um, so generally, a chemical engineer works a lot with a process. So one way to think of what a chemical engineer does is to take a low-value product and turn it into a high-value product by means of some kind of a process. So sometimes the, the image that people have in their head of a, what a chemical engineer does is chemical production. And that's definitely something that we can do, and we do it pretty well. Um, but that's certainly not everything that we do. So think of any time that you've got a low value material that's being turned into a high value material. Take for example, seawater, right? If you live in Southern California, we definitely take seawater, which is on its own pretty high value, but then we turn it into something of even higher value by running it through like a desalination plant, or a reverse osmosis plant. And so that's taking a low value product and turning it into a high value product. Another one is what happens to the water that we send down our toilets. You know, it's any kind of uh, water recycling is pretty big in Southern California. So I can't, actually I can show you. Um, if you've ever seen, let's switch the cameras around. So right here you can see a little bit of purple pipe. Um, and purple pipe is pretty common in Southern California. That's recycled water, right? It's, it's been retreated. It's not quite good enough for you to drink, um, but it's still good enough that we can put it on our uh, plants on any kind of uh, landscaping that we have, and that'll save us a fair amount of water, right? We don't have to use fresh water 
to water the, the stuff that's around us. That again is taking a low value product, which would be wastewater, and turning it into a higher value product, which in this case is irrigation water, uh, or in other cases could be actually drinking water. Um, there is a, a site off of campus that will take purple water and basically turn it into drinkable water. All of these have a, a similar concept in mind or a, a similar requirement, which is energy. They all require energy to operate and without fail, there isn't a process that exists that doesn't need to cool something down. So sooner or later, a piece of equipment will be running and it will build up some energy that has to be released to the atmosphere. Uh, maybe you're running a chemical reaction, which the vast majority of those are exothermic reactions, so they're also going to give off energy. There's a handful of endothermics, but they're, they're not as widespread as, as exothermic ones. Uh, but even the equipment that's run on something like an endothermic reaction is ultimately going to require energy to come out of the system and then be shot to the atmosphere somewhere or the environment in general. And that's through friction. Um, so anytime two uh, molecules are rubbing next to each other, they're going to build up friction and that friction is going to have to go somewhere. Um, right? the, the most obvious place that that friction goes is, or the most obvious manifestation, manifestation of that friction is an increase in temperature. If it's a liquid, the liquid will get a little bit warmer. If it's a gas, maybe it'll expand a little bit too as it gets a little bit warmer. Solids may start to glow if they get really, really hot, and all of that energy has to go somewhere. In an actual factory, or, or in really any kind of a process, whether that process happens to be a factory like the one that we're gonna go through here, uh, or if it's not necessarily what you would typically envision as a, a factory, you know, our, our bodies have to get rid of energy too, and we don't often think of our bodies as factories. Um, but it has to go somewhere. In an industrial sense, we can usually get rid of it in a couple of different ways. The easiest, or, or I would say probably the most common way, is to just vent it directly to the air. So any kind of a piece of equipment that you ever see a fan on or a little uh, set of cooling fins or something like that, it's dumping that energy from friction or that energy potentially from a chemical reaction into the atmosphere by transmitting the energy up into those fins, maybe there's four of them, like my finger here, up into the fins and then the fins release it to the, the atmosphere. That's a pretty common way. So most pumps that you would walk next to, if you hear the pumps, you can probably hear the fan itself running um, and that fan is drawing in fresh air uh, to cool off the pump. Another very common way though is to put the hot fluid, if it's a, a liquid or a gas, next to a cold fluid, right? And the energy from the hot will be transferred over into the cold and the cold fluid will warm up a little bit. That's okay, but sooner or later that cold fluid has to cool itself down. There are a couple of different ways that we can cool the cooling fluid, right? So that we can hopefully recycle it and not you know, get rid of it because that's somewhat inefficient. We can get rid of it if you happen to be near uh, a, a very large water supply. So maybe you have a lake around you, maybe you have um, plenty of water underneath the ground that you can pull up and continually recycle as, as cold water. More often though, we, we try not to just like dump that warmer now cool water into a river or dump it into the ocean or something like that. Although if we treat it properly, that can be done. Uh, it just tends to be pretty wasteful, um, especially in the context of Southern California where we don't have a lot of water to be doing that. And so one thing that we can do is recycle that water through some kind of a cooling loop. Um, and that's the element that we're gonna look at today. One way to do that, as I said, is through like a lake or something, right? You can just pump it out into a lake it'll eventually cool off because it'll exchange some of its energy with the atmosphere and then you can draw it back in. That's great if you happen to have the space to build yourself a lake or you just happen to have a lake around there that's not going to take that water and get rid of it. Um, but more common in areas that are already developed is to build what's called a cooling tower. Um, and so a cooling tower is this thing that's above my left shoulder over here. And the idea of a cooling tower is to take that water that is itself used to cool other things and cool it down. The way that a cooling tower works is primarily through evaporation. And you've experienced exactly the same idea behind a cooling tower, whether you know it or not. Uh, every time you get out of a shower, you have probably felt that you are colder while you are still wet, right? As that water is still feel, forming that film over your skin, you feel colder than after you dry off and that water is no longer there. Or maybe you go swimming in a pool or you go swimming in the ocean. And usually right when you get out of the, the water, it's quite a bit colder than right after you dry off. The majority of that uh, reason, or the majority of the reason behind the, the coldness that you're feeling isn't just that the air is cooler than your skin. That's true, and it does affect the fact that you feel colder, but the, the bigger effect is due to the evaporation of the water from your skin. 
So a lot of what chemical engineers do can be well understood by just envisioning molecules sort of jiggling around. The only water that comes off of your skin, unless you actually like flick it off of your skin, but the water that evaporates is the water that's moving fastest. So maybe it got bumped by a nearby molecule or maybe it's absorbed some of the, the energy from your skin, which is itself jiggling. Uh, only those molecules that are moving fastest are the ones that tend to get thrown off of those water molecules. And that's what we think of as evaporation. When we do that, those, those fast moving molecules are no longer part of the water that remains. And so its temperature is actually a little bit lower. Temperature, at least in, in kinetic theory, like most chemical engineers can get knowing kinetic theory and not having to go too far into quantum, um, the idea of what do we mean by temperature average the motion of a molecule in a, of molecules in a mass, right? So if I take the, the fast moving ones and them, which is the process of evaporation, what's left is not moving on average as fast as it used to be, right? It's not jiggling as fast as it used to be. And so it's a little bit what we would call colder than it used to be. And that's exactly what's happening inside this cooling. I'm going to let the other guy in a moment here tell us a little bit more about that. But generally, what's happening is warm water is falling down through that cooling and it's being broken up into droplets and sheets and stuff like that, and sucking in fresh air through the bottom of the tower. It doesn't always have to come in from the bottom. Sometimes it comes in on the other side. Uh, and what it's encouraging is a lot of evaporation. And the more water that evaporates out of it, the cooler the remaining water happens to be. And then we collect all that water at the bottom of the cooling tower. Oh, sorry about the audio cutting out a little bit. Uh, we'll just have to go for it as best we can. Um, as the water gets collected down at the bottom of the cooling tower, it then gets put back into the plant to go on and actually uh, cool other processes. Yeah, the connection might be a little bit iffy. Um, we'll just have to deal with that as, as best we can, which is to say work through it because um, we are on cell surface out here. But I think we'll be all right uh, going through the rest of it. So that is the general idea of a, a cooling tower. What I'm going to allow now, and we're going to go knock on their door here in a couple of minutes, um, is a guy named Tom. So Tom Insel works with the cogeneration facility. Um, he's going to tell you, A, what a cogeneration facility is, what they do, uh, and then B, how the cooling tower fits into that. Um, and then we're going to spend some time walking around the cooling tower and looking at various um, aspects of the cooling tower, some of the equipment that's required, um, as well as Again, hopefully we'll be able to get up on the top and actually see down inside of the, the cooling tower. The last thing that I want to mention that we probably won't be able to see while we're over there is the actual material that's inside of the cooling tower. Maybe Tom will have a little bit of it available for us, but we can't always see inside of it. Um, a big feature when you're trying to encourage evaporation is surface area. So if, for example, I have my little cup of coffee right here, and I want this to evaporate as fast as I possibly can, Obviously, the way that it works right now is not going to be particularly fast evaporation because the only opening is the top of the coffee cup up here. So what can I do to make things evaporate more efficiently or more effectively? I could certainly take the lid off, right? This has increased the surface area on the uh, top of the liquid, and so there's more opportunity for those fast-moving molecules to jump off the top of the liquid. That can go even further, right? I don't have to leave it in the cup if I really want it to evaporate. The other thing that I could do is just throw it out onto the ground, right, and really spread it out so that there's an enormous amount of surface area. That would be pretty effective. Um, unfortunately, I would lose my coffee, and I actually want my coffee, so we're not going to do that. But we can do that inside of a cooling tower. Um, and so what I hope we'll be able to see at least a little bit if we're on top of the cooling tower is the material that's inside the cooling tower is sitting there and trying to spread out the water as best it can, uh, and that's called fill cooling tower fill. There's two kinds of fill. There can be some that's kind of structured. Um, so if, if you think of, you know, a couple of pieces of plastic interlocked like this, but then they're, you know, probably about this wide. I can't really show you how long they are, but they're at least as tall as I am. And they're stacked up in order inside of that cooling tower. And that's called a structured fill. Um, so it has a, a structure. If I look at the cooling tower and then I look back at you and then I look at the cooling tower again, the structure inside of the cooling tower is the same. That's actually contrasted to another type of fill that sometimes shows up inside cooling towers, which is called a random fill or a dumped fill. Um, and so that is exactly what it sounds like. It's random. It has actually just been dumped inside of the cooling tower. Um, they're usually small. They're not bigger than, you know, maybe a little bit bigger than a ping pong table. 
There's Tom himself. He just snuck out. Give me just a second, Tom. We're gonna go over and talk to him in a minute. Um, but that random fill that's inside of the uh, tower is not always the same, right? If I look at the tower, and then I look back, and I wait two minutes, and then I look back at the tower, it's possible that that random fill is not the same way that it was before. Um, because the water may have hit it and shifted it around a little bit. It can't go anywhere, right? It's stuck inside of the tower, uh, but it may not look the same at every moment in time. It definitely doesn't look the same if you take it all out and put it all back in, uh, because you're gonna dump it back inside of there. It's gonna be a little bit randomized again, um, but it'll still generally serve the same purpose, which is to spread out all of the material. That's the general idea of a cooling tower. As we just saw, Tom snuck out. He is right on time. It is like three minutes before 11, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna tidy up here for just a moment, so bear with us, and then I'm gonna go over there and hand Tom the mic, um, and we're gonna have him describe to us what it is they do here. Um, so give me just a second. If you have any quick questions before we talk to Tom, I, I know the audio cuts out a little bit, it's sort of desyncing, um, but if you have any other questions, you can shoot them into chat, and I'll try and answer them before we talk to Tom while I'm tidying up over here. I'm also going to move the mic so that it's a little bit closer. Now my guess is also the audio is going to change its volume a little bit as we're talking. There's not a lot I can do about that, so you'll just have to keep your finger on your uh, volume button on your phone. Um, the other thing is when we actually start walking around inside the uh, plant, it's going to be a little bit louder. Um, and so Tom and I might have to speak up a little bit. And again, that's probably gonna make the, the volume go up a little bit higher than it might otherwise. So apologies for that, but that's the, the risk of actually going into a live plant. All right, I'm gonna take you guys off of your stand. So you're gonna jiggle around a little bit here. You're on a gyro, so you should be fairly stable up there. Aha, freedom. You can feel yourself jiggle. Hey, as, as long as it's not actively dropping the camera, because when I say camera, I actually mean my own phone, which would be really problematic if that dropped. You have to take it out of its case to put it inside the gyro, which I don't really feel 100% comfortable doing. All right, I'm going to grab the other mic. Sorry if it goes out. All right, let's go meet Tom. I'm going to switch you around so you're not looking at me because I'm boring enough. There we go. Let's go see Tom. Oh, sorry, I was holding on to that mic right there. You can probably hear every little motion I make on that mic. Sorry about that. Tom, how you doing? You take that and just clip it right up there. This can go anywhere. Say hi, Dr. Horvath. There he is. Hello, You're hello, on camera. Hello. You want to go over here where it's a little quieter? Sure. Starting 
be three. Right? All right. So I'm going to have you introduce yourself, um, but then I'll just have everybody verify that they can actually hear your mic. Okay. Just to make it work. So nice to meet, see you again, Tom. Nice to see you too, Doc. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the Central Utility Plant. My name is Tom Insel. I've been here 20 years and we're going to show you kind of a little bit about what goes on inside. Cool. Okay, so uh, Duke, you're available right now. Can you hear Tom okay? We're on a slight delay, so it takes us a minute to figure it out. Yep, okay, cool. So they can hear you okay. Can you get it maybe a little bit up on like this part of your collar? Now that, yeah, that's your other one. I'm gonna lose this part. Look at all the wires you have to wear just to do your job. You can't hear anything otherwise. <laughs> Hello, one, two, three, four. If you do it, it's it's underneath your collar. Yeah, if you just flip it 180 degrees, beautiful. Oh no, now you've broken it. Would be the first thing I broke. Cool, we're ready to rock and roll. Very good, so let's go look at the control room. Okay, so we're gonna head on inside, yes? yes. Okay, where are we on campus, by the way? The, I think some people might recognize it, but where are we? This is the first building that was built on campus back in 1964 when Ravel College, so the first college, was built. So they so knew back this then. This is like Ravel over here? This is Ravel College. The Shea Cafe is just outside the entrance road. Okay. York Hall, Mayor, Bonner, Galbraith. Cool. Um, is it okay if I, maybe I'll take the bag and stuff. We'll just leave it inside, inside the room. Cool. Let's rock and roll. Oh yeah, sure. Thanks, Steve. Get a good shot of that gate opening. They don't do that for just anyone, you know. <laughs> and we are coming in. If you don't want to be filmed. 